Welcome back to Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. Last time we have what I like to call the inciting incident of the story, that is Dayan's invasion, and this time we're going to see how this shatters the normal routine of the Grail mercenaries and sets them on the start of their real journey. So, back at the fall, we pretty much know who everyone is now from those map uh, models. So, I guess we'll finally figure out who she is. Although the name tags already tell you. That's something that actually bothers me slightly about this game. I wish that characters weren't referred to by name in their name tags until they formally introduce themselves. That's probably because I play so much Ace Attorney though, and that game loves to have characters labelled as question marks until they reveal their actual names. The whole My Lord thing is probably a translation of Summer. Alincia probably spoke very formally in the Japanese version. Yeah, he wasn't the one who actually found you. Yeah, being found wounded at the site of a major battle is probably a sign that you're someone at least related to one of the forces fighting. And considering there are a lot of Crimean royal knights in the area... So remember I said helping some person on the side of the road is probably not going to cause much harm? Well, if they just so happen to be the princess of a country that's currently being invaded, yeah, that might actually drag you into things. So she's a secret princess. TV Tropes actually has an entire trope for that. But in this case it was less for having an emergency successor to the throne and more, as Grail says, to avoid a possible blood feud within the royalty, which also makes sense. I have a feeling this isn't going to be good news. Yeah, usually when the main character's homeland gets invaded, the currently reigning king and queen get slaughtered. It's just a thing that tends to happen in Fire Emblem games. Okay, so we don't know the whereabouts of Renning or any of them. Well, we have no idea what Gallia is at this point, but we do know that it's ruled by someone named King Canagus. And that explains all the corpses we found in the last chapter. And unfortunately, yeah, if the king didn't know about her, that'd be a pretty good trump card, but uh, no. They had to tell all the royalty about her, including the one who was blatantly evil. Yes, and the fact that she's here means bad things for us now.
I mean, we could think of her as just a very important client. This fact was kind of obvious. You could probably tell by her armor, actually. Looks similar to the armor that Renning wore in that cutscene. But it does make sense that Titania would have some prior military training. She seems like a veteran. But what made her quit the Knights and become a mercenary? Yeah, obviously you wouldn't know that she existed because only the royalty was made aware of her. Well, that's at least something. It's not definitive proof, but it makes it pretty likely. <laughs> Unfortunately, no one will ever be able to take this line seriously again, thanks to certain voice acting. That's actually not the last time that line is said in this game. It's actually get said quite a lot. Well, it means we're officially involved. There's really not much to debate now. It's pretty likely she's really the princess, if we've now got an army surrounding us demanding we give her to them. So, let's take a vote. What side are we all on? Here's Titania weighing in. That's a good point. And this is a good point too. Even though Titania is supposed to be the emotional one, she can combine emotion and pragmatism pretty well. I have a feeling I know how Soren's going to respond. Soren is motivated almost entirely by pragmatism. But this does make a lot of sense. Having the stronger side in our debt would work out for us. <laughs> well, I mean, those two words describe you pretty well as well. But Shinnan is siding with Sorin. Not so much for his points and more for the fact that he really doesn't want to go to Galia. Meanwhile, Gaytree is more concerned with the princess being a beautiful lady. Um, yeah, uh, how is that relevant right now? He seems to be going with Grail's decision, so let's put him on Team Undecided. Currently have one vote for help the princess and two for help Dan. But now we have two votes for Help the Princess. Yeah, her fate won't be good if she ends up with them. Boyd's in favour of helping too, so that's now three votes for helping the Princess, but for different reasons than Oscar. Bryce is also in favour of helping her, but for very different reasons to everyone else. I love this moment because you get such an insight into everyone's character and what they value just from a few simple lines from each of them, based on what to do in one circumstance. It's really cool, in a lot of Fire Emblem games, 
these characters would just get one line in their joint chapter and never speak again. But Path of Radiance is just great about developing all of them, and it doesn't even need a lot of time to do it. Again, just that line from Rice in particular, we just get such an insight into the way he thinks from such a short amount of dialogue. However, Ike is also in favour of helping the princess, so the vote is pretty obviously weighted in one direction. Yep, so Soren and Shinden are going to be disappointed, but they were the only people who were voting don't help her, so yeah. Wait a minute, what do you mean by that? I like how the music actually dims for this. For some reason this line's always been very memorable to me, if only because this line is on the back of the box. Like, a screenshot of exactly this moment. So, they weren't even intending to spare us anyway, so that makes things easier. Yep, it's battle time, and quickly we're about to be introduced to one of the biggest differences of hard mode. Oh no. I'm sure anyone familiar with the Fire Emblem series knows what's going on here. Yep, this is a Fog of War chapter. So Grail's going to handle one end, and we have to make sure that the enemy doesn't take this fort. So we have a defend chapter here. One that is also in Fog of War. Let me get an introduction to the boss here. He is yet another armor knight. Well, at least we don't have to deal with that kind of thing. So, this is our first Fog of War chapter. Fog of War is only on hard mode in this game. On normal or easy, this is just a standard chapter that's, you know, just a defense chapter for six turns. I do find it kind of weird that of all the chapters to make Fog of War, it's a defend map, because really that doesn't affect things all that much in my opinion. You're still going to be taking this map very slowly and choke pointing, so how far you can see, all it means is that there are some enemies that you won't really be able to see coming. Anyway, we finally get our whole army, we also have no choice in who to deploy and who not to though, and let me see if I can switch around items a bit. I actually want to give Void the elixir for now. He might actually need this. As for Titania, I think she's fine. Shinnin is fine. I'm going to give... Uh, it's a toss-up whether to give Titania, Oscar, or Gaitry the javelin. But I'm going to give it to... Yeah, I'm going to give it to Oscar for now. Even though it's not going to really help him all that much. Because it weighs him down quite a lot. Sorry, at the moment is fine. Hmm, do I give Boyd the hand axe or not? I find that Boyd tends to be attacking a lot of ranged enemies in this one. Uh, for now, I'll give you the hand axe. I have more ranged power on the front that I plan on using Titania in any way. As for repositioning, okay, I'm gonna have Oscar and Boyd go there. Tatani doesn't really need to be that far forward. And I'm fine with Gaitry being over there. Unfortunately, we can't reposition Ike. So, anyway, that's uh, all this preparation done. Let's go. 
So here, if you actually wait a minute, you wouldn't even get the option because you don't have tutorials on hard. There is actually a tutorial for Fog of War, and it's only available on hard mode. But I'm not going to cover it because Fog of War here works basically the exact same way it does in other games in the series. If you move into range of an enemy that, uh, like, if your movement crosses an enemy that you can't see, you'll be stopped in place. Again, pretty typical Fog of War stuff. I'm going to have Gaitri and Titania plugging this gap here. I think I'm going to have her use the Steel Axe. I'm going to have Sorin attacking from behind these two and hopefully getting a little bit of experience from this. Also, we get a Torch. Obviously, you won't get this on normal or easy, because Torches are useless if you're not on hard mode. Titania is someone I'd rather have attacking than using a Torch, though, so... Might want to give that to someone else. For now, though, Sorin is doubling this guy. He's not being weighed down by the Wind Tome anymore, thanks to getting one point of strength, so that last level up actually was kind of useful. Uh, unfortunately, no Adept. If he got Adept both times, then he would have killed this guy, but it doesn't really matter. There'll be plenty of weakened enemies for Sorin to finish off. So, here's where I get... i actually a little bit worried, because... Hmm. Okay, Boyd's gonna go down here. And Oscar is gonna go next to him for the crit bonus. I like being right up against those enemies, though. Which, in fact, I will be able to do... See? Shoving. Shoving has a thousand and one uses. And now Oscar can go here. Do I use the Javelin or do I... No, I'm just gonna go for a regular Iron Lance attack here. You might also notice the map theme is very, very quiet. It's the same one that played in the last chapter, but on Fog of War maps, they make the map theme really quiet, which I guess fits with the atmosphere. Okay, I'm actually gonna have Rice go around here. I find that people down here don't need healing all that often. And Ike is going to go here. Even though he's leaving the defend point, as long as you plug both of these entrances to the fort, you do not need to worry about the defend point at all. So I probably should have equipped the hand axe with Boyd. Oh well. But yeah, you don't need to worry about the defend point that much if you um, have these entrances plugged. Although, speaking of the defend point, there's something really, really hilarious uh, about this in a speedrun. So, the speedrun strategy for this chapter is to just have Ike stand on the defend point and just do nothing. And the enemies all proceed to run forward and choke point themselves to the point where if you just keep repeatedly ending your turn, you can't possibly lose. Yeah, the AI is that stupid, and it's amazing. I, I remember when I was watching the AGDQ speedrun of this, just the strategy they used for this chapter was amazing. Just like, have Ike stand in one spot and let the AI do all the choke pointing work for you. Because they're dumb. Which coincidentally also tends to happen in one of the other defend chapters of this game. There aren't that many defend chapters in Path of Radiance. Unfortunately though, they're not the variety of def- Oh, that's pretty cool. They're not the variety of defend maps that veterans of the series really like. The kind where you can end them early by killing the boss. This chapter does not end early if the boss dies. In fact, it's actually kind of justified why it doesn't. You'll see when I kill the boss, because even though killing the boss is optional, I like to do it anyway, because that's just how I play Fire Emblem chapters. I like to achieve every optional objective where possible. So in this case, you don't have to kill the boss, but I'm going to try for it anyway. When I first did this, I was thinking that the boss had one of the bands. Actually, they don't. That's a later defend map boss. But yeah, I don't think there is any defend map in this game that you can end early by killing the boss, which is a shame. Radiant Dawn's almost the exact opposite. Pretty much every defend map can be, def uh, can be defended early, can be ended early in that one. I forget if the first one can or not. Actually, I think it can. Anyway. Not the time to be talking about Radiant Dawn now. What I can be talking about is how Ike is fairly effective at taking out these archers. Well, can't double that guy with a steel sword, but he can double this one with a steel sword, so let's do that. Though, I probably could have killed the other one by using the regal sword. I still can't believe that I haven't used that at all yet. 
That will probably change because as you can see out of the corner of the fog there, this is our first encounter with mounted enemies. In a defend map, mounted enemies are extremely frustrating to fight because they love to attack you and then run so you can't kill them. That is very, very annoying. So I'm going to prioritize finishing off the mounted enemies wherever I can. Yeah, mounted enemies in defend maps are always annoying to fight with their hit and run thing. It's very powerful when you use it, and it is equally powerful when used by the enemy. So yeah, that's a sword knight. That one there is a lance knight. I thought it was an axe knight for a second. Axe knights on the map, they look like they're holding pole axes rather than actual axes, so I sometimes mistake them from la uh, for lance knights from a distance. The cavalier death animations in this game are kind of silly. They just slump over on their horse. Gaytree is gaining a lot of speed. I'm impressed by this. Though he's not gaining a lot of strength. And he still has a pretty decent strength lead on most people. Okay, Boyd is hurt a little bit. Let me see what happened. Uh, yeah, Hand Axe is actually going to stop me from doubling things. I might not want to do that. Although... Hmm... Could try and javelin this guy. Maybe I'll go for that. I will need to have Rice heal Boyd here, though. I need to be careful of Rice because there are archers. And obviously, you do not want a fragile priest getting hit by archers. Thankfully, uh, most enemy archers at this point really suck and uh, can't really double anything. That's exactly enough for a kill, but it does require going out of bomb support range, which, now that I think about it, it might be a good thing for Boyd to be out of bomb support range. Because Boyd could suffer from death by awesomeness here if I'm not careful. I've used this term before, but uh, death by awesomeness is what I like to call um, when a character is in a choke point and they kill too many enemies, which causes more enemies to attack them, and thus... They get hit by more things they, they can handle, and they die. Oh, that was a bad level up. That's kind of a shame. I would have liked strength and speed there. Hmm. You know what? I actually want to do this. Just I can't kill you anyway. That's annoying. Oh, well, I'll just stick Shin in here, and hopefully the enemies will focus on him rather than Void. Because Void's low defense is really starting to show at this point. When I did my practice playthrough of this game, I had Boyd and Oscar on the lower... Well, not lower. I had Boyd and Oscar on the western choke point, whereas I had um, Titania and Shinnan guarding this choke point. Here, though, I'm going to switch things around, mainly because this will be more experience for Boyd, and also it will mean that I can break through the Western Choke Point more easily, which I will need to do with someone as strong as Titania, because I will almost certainly need her to finish the boss. This is one of those times where I really don't mind if Titania gets the boss kill, because it's sometimes the only way I actually can kill the boss. And I'll need to prioritize safety in killing the boss here, because the chapter does not end instantly when the boss dies, and thus if I have Ike run in and kill the boss, but he's heavily damaged and the rest of the enemies finish him off, well, that won't be good for anyone. And now we're about to see why mounted enemies in defend maps are annoying, although that guy only moved away one space, so that's at least better than he could be doing. We're hearing the enemy face battle theme a lot. And yeah, Boyd very easily could have suffered death by awesomeness, and also I knew this guy had a javelin because the camera panned very slightly when he attacked. But yeah, Boyd could have easily suffered by death, um, suffered from death by awesomeness if he had crit the hammer guy. Meanwhile, Titania is just so awesome that the concept of death by awesomeness is pretty much alien to her, mostly. I have actually had Titania come pretty close to dying on this map before, so I do need to watch out for her. Also need to watch out for her Iron Axe. That's running out. We did get another one, and Void could probably afford to only have one Iron Axe for the time being. 
To this point that I sometimes like to trade one of Titania's Steel Axes to Boyd, just in case he needs extra power. Sometimes Boyd can get enough strength to start doubling with those, and then... Yeah, then things are really awesome. Okay, a lot of enemies are dying here to Titania. Now let's see, okay, we've got that guy, and yeah, that hammer is droppable. There's a very good reason for this. They really want you to use it for the boss. But we do have Sorin and uh, Ike's Regal Sword, so we're not in too bad shape here. Alright, so you, Steel Axe and Hammer, do any of you have... None of you have javelins. A lot of enemies early in the game generally won't carry two weapons. That changes later on, but at this point you won't often see enemies that have both a javelin and a regular lance, for example. Okay. I do need to be careful here, because I don't want to run too far forward and get overwhelmed. Let's see what Soren can do. Unfortunately, Soren can't really finish off a lot of these enemies. Soren could finish off that, though, if I, um... If I have Gate through do this. But yeah, this being Fog of War, you don't want to advance too far into unknown territory. So I have to be careful, otherwise Soren could end up getting mobbed by a bunch of things that come from down here. Also believe there are reinforcements in this chapter, so I'll need to be aware of that. Okay, good, at least Ike doubles with the Regal Sword. The Regal Sword has a fairly generic looking model uh, on battle screens, though. Almost looks a little bit two-dimensional. Speaking of which, one thing I really like about this game is that weapons all have unique appearances in battle. Which was something in the uh, GBA games that I wouldn't say it annoyed me, but um, I definitely really, really like how things look here. Even tomes actually have slightly different appearances in battle for the few units that actually do show the tome. Although, uh, wait a minute, I think only mages... No, I think only Radiant Dawn Mages actually show the tone when they're attacking, but still. But yeah, like, Iron Swords look different to Steel Swords and things like that. Like, that's pretty standard in the newer games, but... This, I think, was the first game in the series to do that since Genealogy, I think. Because Genealogy did have unique sprites for every weapon in battle. I still love that animation so much. I guess catching the moonlight on her axe there. Again, I need to be a little bit careful about how far I advance here, but I think... Actually, wait, no. I'm gonna have Titania go here just to make sure that nothing can, like... Because, like, let's say if she was here, if there was a cavalry unit around here, it could go up there and attack Sorin, whereas now it's blocked uh, from going this angle. It has to go the long way around. Okay. Now Boyd will smash this hammer guy. Yeah, the other reason why I decided to put Titania on the lower front when it comes to choke pointing is because I forgot about this when I did my practice playthrough. This path doesn't lead anywhere. The map just ends here. I originally thought that there was a path to go down and get to where the boss was another way, but no. If you want Titania to reach the boss easily, she has to be in the center. I don't really want Oscar going ahead too much. Hmm. Actually... I wonder if Oscar could finish this thing off if uh, Shin and... Well, I mean, if Shin and Criticals, this guy's dead anyway, but... No crit! But yeah, I wonder if Oscar could use his javelin on this guy. Because I just realised I'm worried about these cavalry running up, hitting Boyd, and then running, and then letting the Steel Axe guy go to town. But speaking of hit and run, I can do that too. Just enough! Good. I mean, thanks to Provoke, they're probably going to attack Shinnan anyway. I feel like Oscar probably should be higher level. I'm just not focusing on him as much because I don't plan on using him uh, on my final party. Which will probably come as a surprise to a lot of people. What is it with 
Oscar and gaining magic lately. It's weird. His magic growth is not that high. And yet in both this and a different Path of Radiance playthrough that's currently going on as of me uploading this, Oscar seems to be getting magic a lot. It's not that useful to him, but it's just kind of funny. Yeah, what was I saying about... Oh yeah, Oscar. So yeah, I probably should be using him more if this was a regular playthrough, but... Yeah, I'm not actually going to be using him on my final party. Nor Void for that matter, which is also surprising, but um, I don't know. I just don't actually find myself using Void very much. In this playthrough, I want to be focusing on the characters who just... I personally enjoy using the most, and uh, it just so happens there are people who I like more than those two. Oscar and Boyd are amazing, and I definitely think that you should use them a lot if you're doing a regular playthrough of this game, but yeah, and that little pan there means reinforcements just showed up. What I'm trying to say is this playthrough is where I'm going to focus on using characters that I want to show off personally. Definitely gonna need to heal Void after this though. Or not. That being said though, expect Void to still see a lot of use early on. He's still really useful. In fact, I'm like, I... So I guess everyone's just getting magic now. I'm getting weird level ups in this run so far, which actually concerns me. Something that I haven't mentioned yet is that when I did a practice playthrough, mostly just to show that um, I wanted to make sure that I could would get everyone I needed to up to level 20 before the end of the game, which is necessary for transfer bonuses to Radiant Dawn. So I did a test playthrough just to see if I could, and I did get them all to level 20. But in that playthrough, everyone got super, super RNG blessed. I mean, Ike kept resistance. That's how blessed he got. Not just that, Soren gained enough strength to consistently double with Elwyn Tomes from an early point in the game. Heck, he was consistently doubling with El Thunder Tomes. Void gained tons of strength and speed. Ugh, Ike gained uh, quite a lot of stats. Gaytree, well, I mean, Gaytree is pretty much the exact same here. In fact, I feel like Gaytree was getting more blessed here than he was originally. But anyway, um, basically... I got very RNG-blessed characters in my practice playthrough for this game, and that worries me, because that means that uh, the moment that I start recording, I'm going to get very, very bad level ups. On the other hand, though... Uh, oh, also, yeah, that's an Iron Blade. That's absurdly heavy, wow. Yeah, you're losing so much speed from that, but... Um, once your characters gain the strength to double with that consistently... Uh, actually, there are some archers down there. I might not want to put Sorin there. Also, the boss does have a javelin. I'm pretty sure he does, so I'll need to keep that in mind. Yeah, for now, I think I'll just focus on choke pointing here. But yeah, I got very, very RNG blessed in my practice run. Oh, and also that would be... Yes, that's S rank! Which is totally useless, because you never get the S rank axe in this game. So yeah, something weird about Path of Radiance is... There are not many S rank weapons that are actually obtainable. Some of them exist in the game's data, but aren't obtainable. And others just flat out don't exist at all, and are still unobtainable. Yeah, it's really strange. I don't know why they did this, but for some reason, Path of Radiance, they just didn't want you to get a lot of S-rank weapons. It was actually, a, like, not so much acknowledged, but... Okay, that's a danger of Fog of War, but Ryus can take one here, that's fine. And yeah, he's not getting doubled because enemy archers suck, and <laughs> that actually made him level up. <laughs> He's an FE1 healer! <laughs> For those who don't know, Fire Emblem 1 healers gained experience by getting attacked, and that was the only way they could gain experience, which was pretty stupid. But yeah, what I was saying was... Uh, actually, I kind of forgot what I was saying. I was too busy thinking about FE1 healers. Ah, there's the boss. Hi there. And yeah, as you can see, he has a javelin. Well, 
still, we still are kind of surrounded, but we're handling it. So yeah, this guy will move to attack you, obviously. Also, you may have weapon triangle advantage, but you are horrendously weighed down. Iron blades do hit very hard, though. You don't want to underestimate them, but still. One of the few things that can actually do decent damage to Titania on this map. I have completely forgotten what I was talking about. Oh, that's another iron blade. No matter how many of them there were here. Like I said, I have had Titania get pretty close to dying in this chapter before. Okay, yeah, I knew one of the Iron Blade was droppable, I just forgot which one. So, he is the boss, and he has an Ashera Icon, which is an item that raises luck. Which usually are only worth being sold. Oh, right, that's what I was talking about, S-Rank weapons. So, yeah, the lack of S-Rank weapons was actually, um, like, they were asked about that in the Japanese FAQ. Like, someone asked, why aren't there that many S-Rank weapons in this game? And, like, I think the developers said something along the lines of because we didn't want, um, to give people too many powerful weapons or something. Like, they felt they were too game-breaking. But it's still weird that you're able to achieve an S rank and yet you can't really do much with it. Although, I think this game does have an S rank bonus. Like, you get plus five hit and uh, critical to your weapon if you're using it with an S rank. But still... Okay, yeah, that's bad. Hmm. Now I actually wish you had the elixir. And I also wish you had the hand axe. How much damage does Ike take from these two? 16 and 12. 12, 8. That's, um, 5 and then 16... 8 and then plus 1, 9. Except he's also going to take a hit from the boss. Almost certainly going to be taking a hit from that boss there. There also could be more enemies hiding in the fog. Also, Soren can't take two hits from the enemies here. Yeah, see, ideally, I'd have Titania more healthy. However, let me just quickly check something. 4 and 0, and she takes 5 from the boss, so if she uses a Vulnerary, she should be pretty much safe this turn. I think she can probably go there. Don't want to do that though, because yeah, Sorum could get attacked by two Javelins in the same turn. Also, if he goes there, he gets attacked by two javelins in the same turn. I normally have Soren um, with higher experience at this point, but... Hmm. We have one more turn. So, not really that bothered with um, not killing the boss just yet. We can be as offensive as we want next turn. Also, Shinnan's taking a surprising amount of damage. And finally, he criticals, but it's pointless. Okay, one of you has a Steel Lance, which means Boyd is... Okay, yeah, Boyd's probably going to double the Steel Lance guy. Not with a hammer, though, because, yeah, hammer has a weight of 20. Not very useful, except against armored enemies. This is unfortunate, because ideally I want Oscar here, and then Boyd could get the critical bonus, but, um... Probably won't be able to do that, and I don't want to expose Rice to any more potential attacks. Maybe crit? That would be nice. Even though you only have a 60... Nope, you did it! You did it! <laughs> well then. And I guess you'll stay there, because... Don't... Yeah, no, there is no way that Ryze can get attacked by a ranged enemy unless they have a longbow. Which I'm pretty sure are not in this map. There are going to be longbows in another defend chapter, I know that much, but not in this one. So meanwhile, these two will just go a little bit further forward. 
Well, there was an archer there, but he couldn't attack Rice. But yeah, Fog really doesn't change this map all that much, except make it a little bit more risky to advance forward, and also make it um, a bit risky because you don't know when more enemies could be coming. It also means that you can't really tell what type of reinforcements the reinforcements are, because they'll almost always be off-map by the time they spawn, which is really irritating. That's why Fog of War plus reinforcements is always not a good combination. Maybe I would have got more mileage out of giving Gaitry the Javelin, but that's fine. I was going to go on a tangent about a certain map in Radiant Dawn that has Fog of War and reinforcements, but actually does them really well. But, yeah, I don't want to go on too many Radiant Dawn tangents, because this game is not Radiant Dawn, obviously. Oh, she's so close to leveling up. Yeah, I thought there were more out there. It would have been tragic, but also kind of darkly funny if one of them had a Horse Slayer. Well, actually, no, it's called a Night Killer in this game. They're so inconsistent with that weapon. Sometimes it's called Horse Slayer, sometimes it's called Night Killer, sometimes it's called Rider's Bane. Like I said, inconsistent. I mean, Rider's Bane is probably my personal favourite uh, name for that weapon. Just sounds really cool. Okay, so now... Didn't see any reinforcement spawns, but I still have to be careful. This is kind of risky, but... Okay, so if that's 11 times 2, that puts you down to 11 HP, and then Sorin doesn't kill you. Okay, then. Meanwhile, 13 times 2 puts you down to more Sorin doesn't kill you. I'm probably not going to have Sorin get the kill on this guy. Hmm. However, I do that and then use Ike's Regal Sword on him. That might work. Haven't mentioned it yet, but I really love this game's generic boss theme. But yeah, I like most of the music in this game. It has one of my favourite soundtracks. I'd say Path of Radiance has one of the most consistently good soundtracks in the... That is a lot more enemies than I thought there would be. Has one of the most consistently good soundtracks in the series. And, as always with Ike, unique quote. Yeah, that was, um, not gonna work, obviously. Nice dodge there, though. Okay, Ike didn't crit. That at least means that Sorin gets to get the boss kill here. Do have to be kind of careful, though? Because I don't want everyone dogpiling on... Okay, there are two javelins. And Sorin does not like getting hit by two javelins. However, I don't think they'll both be able to attack him and span at the same... Okay, they actually will, but if I position everyone just right... Let me just see, because I would hate to have Titania die here. That would be really embarrassing. Four. It's actually kind of a problem, because if she gets hit by one of them on this phase, she might actually die on the other phase. And there's no way I can fully block them off. Okay, gonna have to go for this. And here you're about to see some kind of interesting dialogue. Seriously, a surprising amount of guts from random enemies. And this is why the chapter doesn't immediately end uh, after the boss dies, because everyone just goes crazy and just goes, Ah, oh, we must avenge him! Okay, um, speed's good and magic is also good, so that's fine. I'll take that. Here is the real issue, though. Okay. So. 
I just thought of something. Your health bar is unfortunately blocking this, but if I change the angle here, which you can do with the C-stick, if I put Titania there, that might seem kind of weird, but it actually means I don't think these Javelin people are going to be able to attack Sorin. Although, wait a minute. One, two, they have six move. Okay, yeah, so this guy is going to take exactly all of his movement to reach that spot. This guy, on the other hand, only takes five. But if I put Titania there, he won't be able to move through that space. And that means one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't think he'll be able to reach. Don't think Titania needs to use a Vulnerary here, but I'm going to do it anyway. I really hope I did this right. That guy can't reach, um... Yeah, and neither of them can reach that square either, so yeah, Soren should be perfectly safe here. Unless he somehow goes berserk with Adept and kills one of them. Which would count as death by awesomeness. So how fitting that I brought that up earlier. That's not likely, but it would be kind of dumb if that did happen. Probably could have planned this a bit better, but um, I guess it was hopefully worth it. Wow, I'm doubling with a javel and that is really sad. It's hopefully worth it if it means... Yeah, actually I'll do that. It's hopefully worth it if it means Sorin gets the boss kill and the boss dies because that gets me the Ashira icon. Oh, also something that I should point out, you might be wondering, uh, this is a, a a mission where you're forced to take exactly six turns, so what does that mean for the turn bonus experience? It means that this chapter does not have bonus experience at all. None. So no matter what you do here, it affects nothing in terms of bonus experience. Some later defend maps will have extra conditions that will give you more bonus experience. This one is not one of them. So, you don't need to worry about bonus experience at all here. I, I wish they'd done something like, they give you like, maybe 50 for killing the boss. That would be kind of nice. But, because that's probably the only kind of optional thing you can do in this chapter. Well, the only major optional thing you can do in this chapter. <laughs> okay, they decide, uh, they decide to attack Gate Tree anyway. That was totally pointless, all it served was to give Gatry one point of experience, but that's uh, the AI logic. They don't get counterattacked, therefore it's a good move. A lot of people have leveled up from that one experience from just sitting and dodging. That wasn't that good, but eh, Titania, can, her base stats are enough to carry her at this point. Thankfully Ike didn't get hit by the boss, because if he did, I might actually be in trouble here. And the other guy is probably going to... Yeah, I thought he'd do that. I'd love to have Sorin clean up the remainders, but we can't do that because the chapter ends now. But yeah, I do think there should have been, like, a bonus experience reward for beating the boss because... Yeah. So, this dialogue is slightly different, um, obviously. Not slightly different, it's pretty different, because if the boss is still alive, the boss is the one who gives this dialogue, and obviously he doesn't say General Dakota's gone. I should mention, though, the boss's fate is not that much better if he lives. You'll see. So, we win. We've successfully defended the fort. But now, we're enemies of an entire kingdom. So we've got to get out of here now. Must be a shame to say goodbye to where you basically live for a long time, but... Uh, considering that we're about to be swarmed by reinforcements, getting out of here is a priority. No, 
I'd say they're pretty good for that job. Might want to heal Titania before doing that, though. Meanwhile, Rice is... Regulated to, um, there is nothing in there that she does not already possess, Judy. Also, Ike being in charge of the princess, that's going to be a recurring theme from now on. And his first action is to immediately order her to help with the chores. Yeah, Ike is kind of blunt about that kind of thing. Yeah, Lindsay isn't exactly your typical princess. She learned a few skills that uh, you don't normally learn at court. Yes, I wonder. I also wonder what foreshadowing is. Yeah, something that's now glowing that didn't used to glow. I wonder what that implies. We'll certainly be finding out eventually. Meanwhile, in generic soldier land... This line is also great. Yeah, they kind of destroyed you. Obviously, this line's different if you didn't kill the boss. So if Dakova survived, he takes the place of this generic soldier in this scene. So, yeah, Dakova dies regardless of whether you kill him in the chapter or not. Yeah, that would have been him if um, he was alive. Well, we're getting an introduction to some of the characters on the enemy side right now. It seems they have a tactician. Now I think about it, there actually aren't that many enemy armies in the Fire Emblem series who have their own tactician. And that can be very dangerous. So we're getting a little bit of an introduction to exactly what Gallia is. They're going to be sending all their forces at us before she gets there. Um, okay then. Already sending a names general after us. <laughs> well, that's one way to put it.
Of course, the moment you gloat about that, it means that um, we're going to prove you wrong. But we'll find out how the retreat goes next time. So like I was saying during the chapter, no bonus experience display because chapter 5 has none. So see you next time.